Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the Gospel of John. I'm going to pick it up, John chapter 2 today. Yesterday when we started, we finished chapter 1, and, and it started off with John the, John the Baptist declaring, Behold, the Lamb of God. And then two of his disciples, one of them being Andrew, heard that. So, and, and they could tell that it was true, so they went and followed Christ. And then Andrew went and found his brother, Simon Peter, the, the writer of the, book, the books of Peter. And he told him that, that the Messiah was here. So Peter believed, and then he went. And then, and then Jesus came to Peter, and he said that, I, I will call your name Cephas, and that's an Aramaic name, which means stone. And remember, even Peter, is his name in the Greek, Petros, means stone also. But it means, it means a small rock, a stone, a stone that can be moved. Never forget that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Christ spoke of the rock that the church will be built upon, that word is Petra, and it means a rock. It means like a, a mass of rock, a cliff, a rock that cannot be moved. And there is only one immovable rock, and that is Jesus Christ. That is the foundation that the Christian church is built on. Not on any man, but on Christ himself. And then, then Christ would also, he would go to Philip, and he would say, follow me. I mean, he knew who Philip was. He knew him from the first earth age, just as he knows all people. And then Philip, he, he, wanted, he, wanted, um, he wanted other people to know. So then he went and told Nathaniel, and he said, the, the Christ, the Messiah that was prophesied of in the books of Moses and in the prophets, he, he is here. And Nathaniel, he kind of had a hard time un understanding at first, but Nathaniel would believe. But then we, we went and read one of those prophecies in Numbers chapter 24. Where it said, a star shall rise out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and he shall smite all the nations that refuse to believe in him. And it even looks even to the future, even to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And it even said there in Numbers chapter 24, about verse, about verse 17 or 20, and it spoke of how, how the Kenites' dwelling place is very strong. Remember the Kenites being the offspring of Cain, the offspring of the serpent. And their dwelling place is so strong. I mean, they sit in the highest places today behind closed doors, just, pull, just pulling the strings of people, just making themselves very rich. And remember, it's the scribe's pen that, is, that is, they often use to twist God's word, to change it in the new translations. That's why it's so important to understand who the Kenites are. That's what, in, out of, in the book of Revelations, there were seven churches only two of them taught who the Kenites are, those who claim to be of the tribe of Judah, but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. Smyrna and Philadelphia were the only two churches that taught that, and those were the two churches that Christ was pleased with. He was not pleased with the other five. So, and, but then what did it say? It said that the Kenites shall be wasted, and they shall, if they refuse to worship Christ. But never forget, even a Kenite can be saved if he accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, anybody that has born in the that has been born in the flesh can be saved. They still have the opportunity for salvation. Even a child of the devil, if they love Jesus Christ, they live will live forever. So that is very amazing. And then Christ, he knew Nathaniel. He said, he said, look an Israelite in whom is no guile, meaning there's no trickery, there's no deceit in him. And Nathaniel couldn't really believe that. I mean, Nathaniel just got done saying, oh, nothing good if you come out of Nazareth, even though Jesus was born in Bethlehem, not Nazareth. But then Nathaniel said, how do you know me? And then Christ said, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Remember, it pointing us to even to Genesis chapter 3, where the, the fig tree, the parable of it began. And we know that we are in that final generation of the fig tree. And, and what does it say in Mark chapter 13, about verse 30? It says, this generation shall not pass until all things be fulfilled. But then Nathaniel said, wow, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Christ, Christ said, oh, that's all I had to say for you to believe? And he said, greater things will you see than this. And, and sure enough, we're going to here in this chapter 2, we're going to see Christ's very first miracle that he did perform during his ministry. So let's get into it and ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for allowing us to understand your word. And we thank you for giving us this building so we have a place to fellowship in your name and to share your word with others, exactly as it's written. And we just ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and that your will be done.
done during this study. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, in Jesus' precious name, amen. So, okay, picking up in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 1. John, chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of, of Galilee, Cana being the place of the reeds. And, and it's, it's the third day since chapter 1, verse 43, where Nathaniel came. But it's, it's the seventh day since we started getting the record of John the Baptist. But it's important to understand, it's been three days since Nathaniel came on. So Christ has brought more people along with him. And this marriage, and this is probably the marriage feast, which the, a marriage feast could last up to seven days at this time. And the mother of Jesus was there. This Cana being about five miles northwest of, of, um, of, of Nazareth. And Mary was there. And well, Let's go another verse. Verse 2. And both Jesus was called, invited, and his disciples to the marriage. Verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Verse 4. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now, this isn't really a good translation. This word woman, it's a word in the Greek of very great respect. You could even read it as madam. And what Christ is saying here is he's saying, Madam, my, my time has, my, the time for my wedding has not yet come. But what does this have to do with me? And this is showing how much Christ looks forward to, to his wedding. When Christ does return at the second advent, and those that followed him that did not that were not deceived by the false Christ get to take part in that wedding, get to take part in the first resurrection. Verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Now this would be the very last words of Mary that are written in the scripture. So that's kind of telling us you pay attention and we should always follow these words. Whatsoever Christ says to us, we better do it. The instructions that are given in God's word we better follow them to the letter, the absolute best that we can. And th this is showing how close Mary was to this family of the marriage, that she had authority to, to, sell, to tell the servants what to do. And this service, this just means like an attendant, a waiter. Okay, verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Now a firkin is nine gallons so you do the math here, this adds up to over a hundred gallons of, is, is what is going to be turned into wine here. And after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, I mean, the, the, at this time, the, the, the religion, the, the false religion, the traditions, the rituals just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And notice it wasn't, it wasn't after God's word, not after the manner of the law. But after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, I mean, they just kept bringing in more rituals, kept bringing in more things. And, and it, one thing that's very true is that the, the more things that you try to bring in, the more, the, the more objects, the, the more ideas that have nothing to do with God's word, the more of those you bring in, the less, the farther away that you go from God. Because you start doing rituals, you start doing things that, and it, it just becomes all a ritual. There's no spirituality in it. There's no love of God in it. Verse 7. Jesus saith unto, him, saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Fill, filled it all the way to the top. And, and what, what this is, this kind of a, a spiritual significance here is that, that the, the wine, it, it failed. I Meaning that the, what they were doing in this marriage feast, that they, they, couldn't even, they couldn't even get enough wine for everybody. It failed. But then, they, but then, as always, Christ came and he healed the situation, teaching us that we cannot do anything without Christ. But Christ heals and fills it up all the way to the brim. He even fills us with happiness when we follow him. Verse 8, And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. The governor of the feast, that's... That's the guy that he, he, he makes sure everything's going right. He's the, he's the master of the party, setting up everything, getting it together. Had to make sure it was to his satisfaction. Verse 9. When the ruler of the feast, that's the same person, had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, 
But the servants which drew the water knew that they saw it happen. They saw Christ turn this water into wine. Over a hundred gallons. The ruler of the feast, he, he didn't know how it happened, but the servants saw this miracle happen. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, verse 10, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. And that, that's exactly how it always is with man, that they want to just do the good things first and th th then they'll, they'll let the bad come later. But you see, it's the opposite when you serve God. Yeah, you, you might struggle a little bit. You might go through, through some hard times. You might suffer for Christ's sake. But you see, after all that bad, you receive eternal life and you receive great rewards. You receive riches. So don't, don't put off the, the thing that might be trying until the end. You take care of the hard things first. And then, then, then things will be much easier after that. And then, see, there are many people that, that oh, they're, they're so holy, they're so righteous. They, they try to say that Christ would have never turned water to wine. Well, they, they completely miss the a big spiritual significance of this. Because, well, first of all, what is wine symbolic of? It's symbolic of Christ's blood. Even when we take Holy Communion, we partake of the bread, which is symbolic of Christ's body. And we partake of the wine, which is symbolic of Christ's blood. And you see, this pure wine that Christ turned the water into, you see, when wine is fermented, it draws all the impurities out of it. And it becomes absolutely pure, exactly as the purity of Christ's blood was. That one who had no sin, and he shed his blood on the cross, the sacrifice for one and all times, so that anybody, all they have to do is love Christ and accept, them as, as their, or accept Christ as their Savior and repent of their sins. And they will have eternal life. So don't let someone that might seem oh so holy, so righteous, try to turn you away from, from the beauty of this miracle that Christ performed. And, and, they've, and people that are like that, they've obviously never read 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. What does it say there? It says, you take a little wine for your stomach's sake, for your infirmities. If you have a little weakness of mind, if, you're, if your body's getting weak, if you're getting sick, then a little wine will help you out with that. And so it is, no, it is no sin to drink just a little bit of wine, maybe a glass or maybe less. But then, but then also you can't go the other way and say, oh, okay, well, I can drink as much, as much wine as I want. I can just get drunk every day. No, God is against that. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, do not even eat with a drunkard. It says, don't eat with an idolater, with a person that's covetous, with a drunkard. It, can, it, it, lob, it puts the drunkards in with those people, with idolaters, with fornicators. And it says don't even eat with them. So to be a drunkard is a great sin. And also, if you know that you can't drink a little wine with that, without getting real drunk, if you, if you drink a little bit, then oh, you got to get hammered, then yeah, don't partake of any wine. But the, the point is that it, it is scriptural that you, it is, it's no sin if you take a little wine for your stomach's sake, for your weakness' sake. But also, you don't want to forget Romans chapter 14, verse 13. That chapter that's all about teaching us how to, how to, be, how to act toward people that are new to the Christian faith. And it's, it says that you better not put a stumbling block in front of any of my children. And why does this come up here? Because if you have, if you have a person that's new to the Christian faith, then you, you might want to be careful because they might be offended by you drinking wine. Even though you know it's no sin to drink a little bit of wine, if you know you can handle it, if you know that you're not a drunkard. But, but you see, the point is, if you, if you make that a stumbling block, if a person new to the Christian faith sees you drinking wine, and then they might think, oh, he, he's not a real Christian, then even though you know that, that his mindset is wrong, you put a stumbling block in his way, and then it does become a sin. You do not put a stumbling block in the way of new Christians. It's important to, it's been, that is so very important because our, our very job in this world is to bring people into the Christian faith. But so don't let anyone that's so holy and so religious ever try to tell you that Christ did not turn this into wine. And even if you want to get that proved even more, the word drunk here, it, where it says, and when men have well drunk, check that word out, met, met usko in the Greek, and it means to, it means to intoxicate. 
It has no other meaning. It only means to intoxicate. So that's exactly what happened. Christ turned this water to wine. That miracle, that symbolic of the purity of Christ's blood. So don't ever, don't ever let someone take that away from you, that perfect miracle that Christ performed. Okay, verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. This first miracle that Christ performed. And yet, yeah, they saw it and they believed. Of course they believed, though they saw a miracle. But don't forget what it says in John chapter 20, verse 29, where Thomas, the one who doubted Christ a great deal, didn't really believe that he resurrected. And then finally Christ came and he said, Here, you see my hands, Thomas? You see the holes? Here, you see the hole in my side where I was pierced? And then Thomas said, Okay, I, I do believe. But then what did Christ say? He said, Yeah, you believe it because you've seen. But Christ said, Blessed are those that have not seen and yet believed. So understand how blessed you are when you have the faith. You know that God is real. You know that Christ was born of a virgin and sacrificed himself on the cross and then resurrected, defeating death. You know that you are so blessed for knowing that to be a fact because you haven't seen, but yet you believe. You have great rewards coming for that. Verse 12. And after this, he, Christ, went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. They were just there a little while. Verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It would only be three Passovers after this that Christ would be crucified, that he would become the Passover lamb. Don't forget what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, it says, put, put off the leaven of yourself, leaven being symbolic of sin. Does it say, do not let yourself be, be have, have leaven. And it says, for Christ, our Passover is, is sacrificed for us, letting us know that Christ is our Passover. And Passover being the high Sabbath, and what does Sabbath mean? It means rest. And we put our rest in Christ every single day. Not just one day of the week, not just certain holidays, but every day we put our rest in Christ. He is our Passover that was sacrificed for us. And notice once again, it said the Jews' Passover. Not, not, the, not the Passover of God, but the Jews' Passover. Once again, they kept bringing in all these rituals, all these traditions, and they made it a feast of man instead of what it should have been God's Passover. It should have been Yahweh's Passover. Verse 14. And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. The, the temple, is, this means the outer court. Found, found people, because, because what, what were they to do? They were to bring an offering into the temple to sacrifice. And what were you supposed to bring? You were supposed to bring the very, very best of your flock, your, the very best animal for, for you to sacrifice to give for an offering to Almighty God. Remember, at this time, we, we do not sacrifice animals. Christ became the sacrifice for one and all times. But at that time, they were to bring their very best from the flock. But what do we have here? You have people just sitting up right there in the outer court saying, oh, well, we got animals. Don't worry about bringing your best. Then just buy from us. Buying and selling right there, right in the house of God. Well, how is Christ going to react to this? Verse 15. And, and, and when he, Christ, had made a scourge of small cords, made a cat of nine tails, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables, the righteous indignation of Christ. Threw them all out. Let them know that this is not what is supposed to take place in my house. Verse 16, and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. The scripture would be fulfilled where it says in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11, that my house which is called by my name, God speaking, you have made it a den of robbers, made it a house of merchandise. I mean, how many churches do you know today, they sell all types of things in their church, selling t-shirts, selling merchandise. God said, do not make my house a house of merchandise. It made Christ so mad that he made a cat of nine tails and drew them all out. Overthrew the table of the money changers. I mean, you know what the money changers are? They, they, they made their own little bank set up right there in the outer temple of the house of God. 
Saying, oh, don't worry. You, you, you need a little change of money to, to, buy these, to buy these sacrifices. Here, go ahead. I'll exchange the money for you. I mean, setting up banking right there in the house of God. The God, Christ was so furious. He drew, he drove them all out. So I don't know, is your church a house of merchandise? They can't wait to get your money any way they can. Because that is what Christ is very much against. Verse 17. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The very righteous indignation of Christ, he could not take it anymore. It was time to drive them all out. And make no mistake, that was an absolutely very righteous thing that Christ did. It was time to get the wickedness out of the church. All they cared about was the money. I mean, the, the people, the high-ups in the church, they're, they're taking a little piece from what the money changers are getting. They're turning a profit. That was all they cared about was making money. And wh where is this written up? Where, where is this, what is this quoting? It's Psalms chapter 69. I want to go there and I want to read it. We're going to go to Psalms chapter 69, verse 1. This, just connect, this connects so perfectly to this whole chapter about how, how the blood, the wine is symbolic, or the wine is symbolic of Christ's blood, that purity. So in this Psalm chapter 69, there is only one chapter, of, there is only one psalm that is quoted more in the New Testament than this Psalm 69, and that's Psalms 22. And what do you know? Both of those chapters are psalms of the passion that have to do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So let's read it. Psalm chapter 69, verse 1. The psalm of David. David being that type of Jesus Christ. Verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. This means that great trouble is upon me, and even my life is being threatened. Verse 2. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. And you can't help but think of Revelation chapter 12, verse 15. The flood of lies that will come out of Satan's mouth when he is here on earth claiming to be God. And his role is the Antichrist. That flood of lies, it's not an actual flood. It's the deceit that comes out of his mouth that's going to swallow up almost the entire world. But not you, because you've read God's word. You know it's the false one that comes first. Verse 3. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. My, my throat is dry. You know what it says in John chapter 19, verse 28? Christ, Christ is up there on the cross. And, and he, he's seeing that all these prophecies are being fulfilled. He's seeing his clothes, lots being cast at the foot of the cross for his clothing as was prophesied in Psalms 22. But then there was still another prophecy that had to be fulfilled. And you know what he said? He said, I thirst. You know, you know why he said that? So verse 21 of this chapter could be, could be fulfilled. I'm going to go ahead and read it just really quick. Verse, verse 21 of Psalms chapter 69. They gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. They, they gave him that, it was a drug is what it was. They gave him that vinegar mixed with gall, but Christ did not partake of it. But why did he say, I thirst? So he knew that they would give that to him to fulfill this scripture. So that all, so that all scripture would be fulfilled exactly as it is written. Okay, back to the beginning. Verse 4, Psalm chapter 69, verse 4. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. This is what Christ would speak in John chapter 15, verse 25. I mean, they hated Christ, even though he was God in the flesh, even though he healed the sick, even though he raised the dead. They hated him without a cause. They that would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully or mighty, then I restored that which I took not away. This last sentence means I must suffer even though I did no wrong. And I, I don't know, when, when you share God's word, do you, with people, do you ever feel like people kind of hate you without a cause? I mean, they, they don't want to hear anything about God's word. And so if they don't want to hear it, don't tell it to them. God said, do not cast your pearls before swine. But when you understand God's word and you teach it exactly as it's written, people are going to hate you without a cause. Well, you can handle it. David could handle it. And Christ could handle it. So you can handle it. You have the power of Christ even resting in you. Verse 5. O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. David didn't try to hide his sins from God. He knows that God knows all. 
And remember Jesus Christ. He had no sin, but he took all of our sins upon himself. Verse 6. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. And those that wait on the true Messiah, Jesus Christ, those that do not fall away into the deception of the false Christ, that they will have nothing to worry about. They will not be ashamed. Because instead of worshiping Satan, you're going to be delivered up before him and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. You will not be ashamed. You will not be confused. You will not be confounded. Why? Because you follow what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where it says, Study to show thyself approved as a workman rightly dividing the word of God. Following, studying God's word verse by verse so you can understand the subject. You can understand what's actually going on and you rightly divide the word. You know who's speaking. You know who's being spoken to. You study to show yourself approved to God so you will not be ashamed. Verse 7. Because for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face. That you're going to be mocked for, for loving God. They're, they're going to reproach you. They're going to talk bad about you. Who cares what man thinks? It's what God thinks of us. Verse 8. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. And I mean, that's exactly what happened with Christ. Basically, everyone ran away from him except John and a few women. They all ran away from him. And did you ever feel like this? you ever feel like a stranger among your brethren? Because maybe that they don't even care about God. You sometimes you feel like I, I'm not like any of them because that they don't even they don't even love God. They don't even they definitely don't even think about studying His Word. And you do feel like a stranger among the brethren. But don't forget, God's elect are not of this world. They were called, predestinated, and justified and glorified in the first earth age, as it says in Romans chapter eight. So you, God's elect, are not of this world. So yeah, it might seem like your brothers are strangers or foreigners to you sometimes. That, that, that means nothing. Don't let that bother you. It's kind of like we're only in this flesh body. We're just kind of passing through in, the, in this flesh age until we return to our truth, until our, we ter, return to our true home and our spiritual body with our Heavenly Father. Verse 9, this is the verse that was quoted. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. The last part of this verse is even quoted in Romans chapter 15, verse 3. Speaking of Christ once again. All the reproaches, Christ took on all the reproaches of everyone else and brought them upon himself. He who had no sin and was crucified so we could be forgiven upon repentance. The zeal, that righteous indignation that David had because he saw that hardly anybody even loved God around him. The righteous indignation, the zeal that Christ had when he saw people making the church a house of merchandise, just buying and selling, all they care about is the money. That righteous indignation built, it, built up in them and it will build up in you as well. And that, 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 there's no sin in that. There was no sin in what Christ did. It's not like we should do what Christ did, overthrow the tables in the church. We are not Christ. But it was a righteous thing what he did and that righteous indignation does build up in those who are righteous. Verse 11. I made sackcloth also my garment. That means I, I, I came into a state of mourning. And I became a proverb to them. Everybody just mocked me wherever I went. That's what David's saying. Once again, don't let that bother you ever. Verse 12. They that sit in the gate speak against me. The gate is where judgment takes place. And I was the song of drunkards. And everyone just, just made fun of me all the time. <laughs> You're, people are going to hate you for serving God. They're going to make fun of you. That should never bother you even one slight little bit. One more verse, verse 13. How should we handle this when we're mocked and we're hated by people? 13. But as for me, David speaking, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. This acceptable time it means a time that thou pleasest. This means that you've got you to be real patient. You pray to God. Don't ever forget, God always hears your prayers. And, but you have to be patient always. God will always pull you out of any tough situation. Finish the verse. O oh God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. And he always does. 
It says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5, God says, I will never leave thee, I will never forsake thee. And he never will. He always hears your prayers. So yeah, even though you're going to see a lot of wickedness going on around you, your righteous indignation is going to build up. You're going to see people hate you. Don't let that bring you down. Just turn to God. Turn to prayer. And his mercy, his salvation, his compassion will bring you through any hard time that you have ever been through. Let's go back to the book of John and finish up this John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing, seeing that thou doest these things? They're saying, by what authority are you doing this? They're saying, show, why don't you show us some kind of sign that you are the Messiah? And don't forget, the Jews, Eudas in the Greek, it doesn't mean they are necessarily of the tribe of Judah. It just, mean, it just means that they are in the, they dwell in Judea. They are Jews by geographical location. No doubt Kenites mixed among them. Verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And they would, at Christ's trial, they would even use this against him. And what, what did the Kenites do? Did exactly as their father do, does. They twisted the scripture. And what, what, what they said that Christ said, they said that Christ said that he will destroy the temple and will rebuild it in three days. That's not what Christ said. He just said, you, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He didn't say that he was going to destroy it. But that is what they said that he said. That's Mark chapter 14, verse 58. So that the Kenites, they always, that they twist the scripture. What, how did Satan tempt Christ in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4? He changed Psalms chapter 91. He added the words at any time. He twists the scripture. Satan knows the scripture so well that, that he could fool most Christians. He knows the scripture better than most Christians. So I hope that you are I hope that you are well studied in God's word so that he can't deceive you, especially on that time when he is here claiming to be God. What do you think he's going to be doing? He's going to be teaching the Bible, but he's going to be twisting it, just adding a couple of words here and there, taking away. So I hope that you're well enough read in God's word to be able to catch it. Verse 20. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. And will thou rear it up in three days? They have no idea what he's talking about. But you all know what he's talking about. Let's document it. Verse 21. But he spake of the temple of his body. He's speaking of that he would be crucified. He'd be in the tomb for three days. Then after three days, he would resurrect the temple. And the temple is simply, and even in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, where it's the eternal heaven, it says that there's not going to be any temple there. For God and, and the Lamb or the temple thereof. And you know what it says about God's elect? I think it's Revelation chapter 2 verse 11. It says that. I, it's, I'm pretty sure it's Revelation chapter 2 verse 11. It says God's elect will be the pillars that hold up the temple. So Christ was speaking of his body. He was speaking that he would be crucified and he would resurrect in three days. But, but these that they had no eye. They didn't have eyes to see and ears to hear. They didn't truly love God. They played church, and they were just in it for the money. Verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And the, the, even the scripture of Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, would be fulfilled by it. They remembered that, and they even remembered that they heard it from Christ's very own mouth, that it would happen. And they knew the words of Christ were true, as they always are. Verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. And I'll mention it one more time, John chapter 20, John chapter 20, verse 29. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. This means he knows how men are. They, he knows human nature. He didn't commit himself to them. I mean, he, he didn't necessarily trust them completely because he, he knows how men are. I mean, he knew that Judas Iscariot would betray him to die. So he, he, he knows exactly how all men are. I mean, 
Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and God the Creator even created all souls. Verse 25, complete. And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He didn't need anybody to tell him how man acts or, or what men do. Christ already knew. And, and this is also teaching us as well, even though we can obviously never even be close to knowing how much Christ knew. I mean, Christ knows men inside and out. But we need to observe how men act and use our spiritual discernment to make sure you don't get ripped off especially when it comes to God's Word. I mean, even in ways of the world, but much more importantly, make sure that you don't let somebody twist the Scripture on you, as the scribes do, as Satan does. You be very careful, and you, you, be very, you, you watch who you listen to. And you, you always, like, like it says in, in the first epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, you test the spirits, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Just because someone is the head of a church, that does not mean that they teach truth. Just at this time, they were buying and selling in the church. That happens so often today. It's just they make it a house of merchandise. Christ went and he overthrew the tables. He said, I do not want you buying and selling in my house. That is not what a church is for. A church is for teaching God's word exactly as it's written. So you test the spirits. How do you test the spirit? By the word of God. What any preacher, what any pastor or priest says, you better make sure what they say is, it lines up exactly with what the scripture says. Or else you might get into a way like they got into where all they cared about was the way of the purifying of the Jews, the Passover of the Jews. All they cared about was their own traditions, was their own rituals. And they, what they really did, they made their own religion. Many churches even do that today. They, they have their own set of rules that they follow, the church hierarchy. They follow their certain denomination. But what does God say in, in, his, in, in his word? He says, you mark those that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of Christ. It, there's a denomination that simply in itself is against God. He says, you mark them that cause divisions. If, if everyone would just follow what God's word says... And there should be no division. So that this very first miracle that Christ performed, turning that over a hundred gallons of the water into wine, symbolic of the purity of Christ's blood that was shed on the cross, that first miracle that Christ would perform. We'll keep getting into it, and we'll keep moving along in Christ's ministry. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your written word and for giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. And we, we just thank you for allowing us to have this place so we can fellowship in your name and we can teach others your word exactly as it's written. We thank you for the spiritual discernment you give us and we just ask you to keep continually give us that spiritual discernment so that we can beware and that we can spot the false ones as, as you, you gave us the instructions to know how. And we thank you so much for that, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This is reported at Smyrna Christian Church, 1623 North Purdue, Kokomo, Indiana. Come join Pastor Jesse Sisko on Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. God bless. October 25th, 2019.